Hello. Earlier you heard about the human hazard analysis, and that is to maintenance basically what cockpit air management is to flying, all our flying tasks. So there are some important differences that we have conducting this testing as an OEM. And one of those is one of the things that they were seeking for the human hazard analysis. And that's how to get the data back to the OEM to change the design. So we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but I think that's an important thing to point out. So. Buttons work. Woo! The 525 is the first commercial fly-by-wire rotorcraft with a factory-installed Garmin 5000H avionics suite. I'm excited to be a part of the program, not only because of this new technology, but because we develop and use innovative testing. When I was a new engineer, that's been a little while ago, I figured out about bird strike and flammability testing, and I decided that that's what I wanted to do. So I wondered who I'd have to talk to to be able to do that. Come to find out, fast forward a few years, and it's all of you. No one told me that it was going to be this much work. But what I wanted to do was just get paid to set stuff on fire. <laughs> but in all honesty, it's, it's an honor to be here, and I thank you for that. Oh. So you can see the cockpit's minimalist design. This is to reduce distraction and workload, yet provide the right information to the pilot when he or she needs it. Bell's cockpit air management is inspired by a fixed wing transport category regulation. The intent of the rule is to have manufacturers demonstrate that a qualified flight crew can detect and manage air in all types of flight. This is a new type of testing and it's not currently required for rotorcraft. So let's step back and use a car as an example. Who in the room can give me a car manufacturer? Mercedes. Say? Mercedes. Mercedes? All right. So imagine, if you will, Mercedes asks you to come in and do scenarios, driving scenarios, with a year 2020 vehicle. Would you all be interested in doing that? Sure. All right, yeah, everything new is great, right? All right, so Mercedes has you drive scenarios in all kinds of situations. Rain, snow, day, night, in city traffic, and on the Autobahn. I've always wanted to drive on the Autobahn. I won't get to this trip. <laughs> but during the simulations, you find out that you make some slight errors, nothing big, but you find that you have difficulty seeing the center screen in bright sunlight. You find that you have difficulty using the proprietary navigation system in high traffic and you miss a turn. And then you also find that on a steep slope, you have difficulty downgrading or downshifting while you're trying to reduce your speed. So Mercedes takes all of this feedback and is able to change the design for those aspects before you can ever buy the car. This type of testing has the potential to improve safety, reduce aftermarket recalls, and improve customer satisfaction. These reasons and more are why Bell is moving forward, working closely with the regulators to develop this testing. The cockpit error management process has four components. We begin with a design assessment to anticipate the user interface error. Based on that information, we select our test points. Then simulation testing is conducted with multiple flight crews to observe realistic, normal, and emergency scenarios. We take that data to improve the design before customer delivery. <coughs> To select our test conditions, or our test points, we came up with a series of questions and applied them to the 525. 
Some questions identify hardware or software that may be difficult to operate or confusing to the pilot. Some questions point out tasks that may have increased workload or may be stressful for the pilot. We also talk to our Bell Training Academy to see if there's items that specifically they're interested in that may contribute to error. They work with our pilots on a regular basis, our customer pilots, and so they are able to bring the customer perspective back into our assessment. Bell has finished the cockpit assessment and has a list of approximately 80 items to go and test for the 525. With these test points, we have a framework and we built six different mission simulated, mission oriented simulations. We have three example results here. The first is engine fire. The 525 uses push buttons for fire controls as we've pictured here. They function as both a source of information and a method of control for the pilot. We need to ensure that they're intuitive to use because this is a high stress task that has to be done in a small amount of time. The second example is smoke clearing. This is a high workload and complex task. The pilots must do some troubleshooting to isolate the source of smoke and then physically isolate it. This has the added complication of limited visibility for both the pilot, the flying pilot, and the non-flying pilot. The last example is dual generator failure. After the loss of generator one and generator two, the pilot must initiate the emergency power source while the system sheds non-essential electrical loads. We need to make sure that the pilots have the feedback to understand what the system is doing at all times. Pilot selection is an important part of test preparation. We need to choose participants who are qualified and trained to fly the 525. These are our flight test pilots, and although they're ruggedly handsome, we don't want to use them for this testing because they're too familiar with the, with the cockpit. Our goal is to use a group of pilots that represent our 525 customers. For diversity, we carefully selected pilots from a range of experience levels and also included international pilots. There's something that I would like to dwell on on this for a moment. I've done this testing at Textron Aviation and spoken to others that have done this testing at other companies. And Bell is the only manufacturer who has actually asked for customer participation. And I think that this is a great opportunity for both our customers and us to gather data and improve our design. Before testing, our pilots will have completed a Bell design training course using several different types of training methods. And our test personnel have also gone through a training program and are certificated human factors observers. We use modified line operation safety audit, or LOSA techniques, to observe and classify errors. They're modified because LOSA uses cockpit observers in the jump seat on real flights. We use cameras to record simulated flights, but we try to make sure that the pilot feels as if they're in, on a normal duty day. And to add to the realism, we make sure that we have an, an air traffic controller to maintain the dialogue throughout the scenarios. The left picture shows the fixed base simulator, which is in a separate room from the test team. This is to make sure that the test team does not interfere with the crew throughout the day. The right picture is a view of the cameras that can be seen from the control room. There are six different camera angles to record the pilot activities, two of which are focused on the pilot's face to determine their emotional state and their focus of attention. Each of the six simulator scenarios we have designed will be repeated at least three to five times with a new crew each time. 
This allows us to review how different pilots react to the same test points, and we can tell if errors are isolated or whether or not they're trends. We collect error data and feedback from the crews, which is then used to determine what changes need to be made to, the de to either the, de <laughs> the design or the procedures. Now we get to talk about my favorite part, testing. Test days are planned to use last a full day. We have a morning session and an afternoon session. So the pilots, and they're not too long, they're about an hour and a half each um, to make sure that the pilots don't get too fatigued because simulations can be more fatiguing to the pilots sometimes than flight. The morning session is an orientation flight, so the crews have time to get comfortable in the cockpit. But more importantly, it's time for the test team to baseline the normal or the unstressed behavior of the pilots. Now, everything, everyone has unique things that they do that they don't realize that they're doing while they're nervous. <laughs> and I'm not picking on my pilots, but they do some funny things. So one pilot went through and he was pointing at everything as he went through the checklist to make sure that he didn't miss anything. And that's, that's trainable behavior and that's good. One pilot went through and actually talked to themselves the entire time, that, noting that this is a dual aircraft or dual pilot aircraft, he was still talking to himself as he's going through each item in the checklist. And one pilot was, I swear that he was on the brink of a heart attack. He was red in the face and he was sweating in the morning during the normal flight. So if we hadn't baselined his behavior, then we would have had skewed data for the entire afternoon thinking that the system is what, well, and it could have been the system that made him um, or the emergency scenarios that made him so nervous, but that was his demeanor throughout. He was, it was almost angry. I've never seen a pilot like that before. It was kind of amazing. So we start the actual test flights in the afternoon. We allow the crew time for pre-flight planning. Then we encourage them to act like they're in the helicopter, on the ramp, ready to fly. We let them get settled in the simulator then we have them run through their normal checklists. Then as they fly, not only do they perform the test points that we've selected, but we also throw in additional real world stressors. We put them in terrain. They may have to do an offshore mission. They may have to fly to a helipad in the middle of a city. And we will put them in weather. The higher the stress and the workload is, the more likely an error will occur, and that gives us more data to feed back into the design and to evaluate the design. The scenario is complete when the crew have completed the tasks and they are safely back on the ground in the simulation. So with all this effort, what are the expected benefits of this testing? Well, at the end, we'll have a test with results that show that the cockpit is resilient to error. But more importantly, error management testing is a way for Bell to show its commitment to its customers and its commitment to enhancing rotorcraft safety. Thank you. I think the questions have to stay until the end.